Well, this morning we have a big passage. You may have been looking ahead in Hebrews at what comes next. And if you have, you know. Maybe as soon as I mentioned that we'd be studying through Hebrews, you responded saying, well, I can't wait till we get to this portion. It's arguably one of the hardest passages in Hebrews, perhaps one of the most hotly debated passages in our Bible because of what's at stake here, what's really in question as we come to this warning. A lot of people wrestle with who is being warned and what this warning actually is. We're starting in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, and we're going all the way through Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. You say, well, you're not keeping us late, are you? No, I already know there's so much information and there's so much that I want to get to. This might be uh, to be continued tonight. If that happens, promise me that you'll remember what we've covered this morning and promise me that you'll come back tonight to pick up where we left off. Can we do that? If you can do that, I promise I won't keep you all through this afternoon. I promise I'll split it up if you'll be willing to work with me on this. But this is a big passage, both in the number of the verses and in its subject matter. There's been a lot of ink that's spilled in this debate. And my goal this morning is not to settle all debates. I don't operate under that false assumption. In fact, you might hold to a slightly different interpretation on some points of this passage, and that's okay. My goal this morning is not to settle all debates. My goal is to let the Word of God speak. This passage isn't about arguing the finer points of interpretation. This passage is really all about responding to truth. So whether you hold the same exact position as I do on each of these verses isn't what really matters. What matters is that each of us will listen to God speak and that we'll respond to him in obedience. So that being said, turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 5. And like I said, we'll read verses 11 all the way through chapter 6, verse 12. And you say, what made you pick this many verses? And I would say, it wasn't me. I picked it, this section, because I think this is one train of thought. And remember, as we study through the Word of God, we want to address each passage in its context. And we have a key marker at the beginning of verse 11, and then it kind of bookends that same word in chapter 6, verse 12. So you'll see from beginning to end, this is one big argument. This is one big thought. This is one big conversation. So to split it up wouldn't help us understand it better. So I know it's a lot. That's why I want to try to get to it this morning. But if we can't, it's okay. I just don't want to stretch it out too long because this is one big idea. So let's, let's start reading here in verse 11. It says this, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are, now note this, dull of hearing. This is what we'll find repeated again at the end of our passage, and this is what kind of keeps this, this whole unit together. It's this one central thought, this dull of hearing. Verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, by this time you yourselves should be the ones that are teaching. And my mouse is not clicking. It's going to be a very long study this morning. Ye have need that one teach you again. Now, for some reason, this is not advancing. And I I feel sorry, Dr. Hughes, if you're going to have to do this the whole time. (laughs) You know what, let me, let me do this. Let me see if I turn off my mouse and then turn it back on if it reconnects. So there's some kind of a signal. It says mouse off and then mouse on. No, this might have to be you, Dr. Hughes. I'm so sorry. Are you, you know, the battery is charged, but that doesn't mean that it's always going to work. Technology is a blessing and a curse, isn't it? We just got our Wi-Fi working this past week, and then this morning it decided to act up. Okay, there it says connected. Dr. Hughes, could you scoot the computer a little closer uh, to that side? Because I might just be getting interference. Maybe I'm just not holding my mouth right. Dr. Hughes, I'm sorry. I guess it's going to have to be on you. Are you okay with that? I know that's a lot. I've got a lot of slides today. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's, let's keep reading here. So, of whom we have many things to say. He's continuing this conversation. Do you remember what he's referencing? Of whom? If you look back one verse, you'll see who this whom is. Do you see it? Melchizedek. So he says, I want to keep this conversation going about Melchizedek. I have many things to say. They're hard to be uttered, seeing that you're dull of hearing. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. 
and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Literally, he is a baby. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible now, this is the core of, of this whole passage. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This is a hard passage, isn't it? For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful. Now that's our word again. It looks different here in our English translation. In Greek, it's the exact same word. That ye be not Slothful is the same word we saw all the way back in chapter 5, verse 11. Do you remember what that word was? Dull of hearing. It's the same exact Greek word, sluggish or slothful. So that's why we have this whole passage, because it starts with this and it ends with this, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So where do we begin Right? When you're dealing with this large of a passage, both in number of verses and in subject matter, it's overwhelming. Where do we start? Context. You, get, you may get tired of me saying this, but I'll keep saying it because context is king. It's important. This is what they, they just drilled into us in Bible college. You, you have to study a passage in its context. Context is what guards us from misinterpretation. Context is what guards us from misapplication. Don't you wrestle with that sometimes? When, when people bring out a passage and then they say, well, to me it means this, how do we avoid falling into that pitfall of misunderstanding Scripture by looking at it in its context, in the big picture? Context is what guides us into right understanding. So we need to look at this passage in its context. What brings us to this point of our text? What is the context here? Verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Our text opens with a reference to a person, and I kind of already gave that away, didn't I? Who is this person that is being referenced here? Melchizedek. Now, you ready for a harder question? Why? We're speaking of how Jesus Christ is perfect. All of Hebrews is about Christ's supremacy, right? 
So then why are we all of a sudden making reference to some obscure person that we find all the way back in the Old Testament with Abraham? Someone by the name of Melchizedek. Why are we speaking of him? Because he's a picture. And he helps us understand Christ and his priestly ministry. The author has just said, come boldly to God. Remember we dealt with that? Come boldly to the throne of grace. Christ is our high priest. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. He's better than the angels. He's better than the prophets. He's better than Melchizedek. And he's why we come boldly to God in spite of our unworthiness, in spite of our sin. We're exhorted to come boldly to God's throne of grace. We need his forgiveness. We need his mercy. We need his grace. We need God's help. And so we can come boldly because Jesus is our high priest. This is what we've been speaking of. Jesus is our perfect high priest. So sin shouldn't keep us from Christ. Sin should drive us to Christ. Jesus has made the sacrifice for our sin. Jesus is our mediator. And right now, Christ is interceding for us. He's interceding for you. Jesus is your high priest, and he's perfectly qualified. This is what we've been talking about. Do you remember this, this progression of thought so far? God appointed him. How do we know that Jesus is really our high priest? Because God appointed him, and because Christ is sinless. And he obeyed God and perfectly met God's demands. That's why we come to Christ. We didn't pick Christ, and Christ didn't even appoint himself to be the priest. God established this. And Jesus is our perfect high priest that Melchizedek was just a picture of. So for us to understand Christ better, the author of Hebrews is saying, understand this Old Testament system of sacrifice. Why? Why? Because all of it pointed to Jesus. Remember, it was just an earthly picture of the heavenly reality. That's, that was the point of the, the sacrificial system. It points to Christ. And in the same way, Melchizedek served in the same manner. He points us to Christ. And that's what brings us to our text today. Verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say. And hard to be uttered seeing ye are dull of hearing. Look, I want to talk to you so much more about Melchizedek, but I can't, is what he's saying. These things are hard to be uttered. So the author of Hebrews is just struggling to explain it. Is that what he's saying? This is too difficult for me to say? No. He says here at the end why it's hard for it to be uttered. Really, we could say it's hard for you to understand why. And he says this stinging rebuke because you are dull of hearing. I want to keep teaching you about Jesus. And Melchizedek is a picture that helps us understand Jesus better, but I can't talk to you more about Melchizedek yet because you are dull of hearing. What does this literally mean, this dull of hearing? Dull is a derivative of the Greek word nathos. And this Greek word nathos means literally lazy. You're lazy in your hearing, or we could say you are spiritually stupid. Say, so that is harsh. This is a harsh rebuke. He's not sugarcoating this. He's saying, look, I want to teach you more, but I can't. And it's not my fault. It's not on me. It's because you can't receive it. You are dull of hearing. I want to teach you more about Melchizedek. I want to teach you more about Christ, but I can't because you're not in a place spiritually right now to handle it. Because you're lazy and you're listening and you're stupid in your spiritual understanding. But notice what he says. It's in the Greek here. This has not always been the case. In the Greek, it's implying you are become dull of hearing. He's not saying this is just how you are. This is how you've always been. You're just someone that mentally is incapable of understanding truth. He's saying there's something that's happened to you spiritually that's keeping you from understanding more truth. That's what he's communicating here. You're become dull of hearing. I think this might be a repeat. It is. We just needed to see this again. You're lazy or you're spiritually stupid. Why? And this is where he's saying, because you've become dull of hearing. This phrase, ye are dull, is, is really better translated, you've become dull. This is something that's happened to you. 
There was a time that this was not the case. There's a time that this wasn't true of you. And the author is speaking to some, this is important for us, some in this congregation. Remember what we've said about the book of Hebrews? This audience is really made up of three different distinct groups. Do you remember what those groups are? Truly saved people. Now, they're all of Jewish background. They're all Hebrew people. Now, some of these are actually saved. They've been saved out of Judaism. They've placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and are genuinely converted. That's one. What, what's another group? People who claim to be Christians but aren't genuinely saved. And then finally, the third group, those who have made no profession of faith and are unsaved. So what he's saying here is this is not true of every single person in this congregation. All of you are incapable of understanding truth. That's not what he's saying. There are some in this congregation that are now in a situation that they hadn't been in before. What's changed? They weren't lazy before. They weren't spiritually stupid before, but now they are. So our question is, who is he speaking to, and how did they get to this point? What's happened? And I think the piercing question for us is, how can I prevent this from being true in my life? Right? This is not, again, just about these people. God gave this word to me. So how do I make sure I'm not in this position? Who has it happened to in this congregation? Is this all of the listeners? No. But which of the listeners? How did this happen to them? And when? How did this come to be that he's saying, now you're in this new situation where you can't handle more truth? How did this come about, and when did this come about? Verse 12. For when, for the time, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. And what do they need to be taught? Which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So there are some in this congregation that this is true of. And these are people who themselves should be teachers. See what he's saying here? Look, you've received so much information that you yourself should be a teacher at this point in your life. By this time, you ought to be teachers yourself. You say, well, by what time? They just haven't learned fast enough. No, the amount of time that they've been exposed to biblical teaching. These listeners that he's referring to have had an unprecedented exposure to the gospel. They've had something that by this point in time, because of all that they've heard, he said, you're without excuse. We saw this back in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And he says, how shall we escape? And this we is, is speaking kindly, but he's, it's a pointed statement. How can you escape if you neglect so great salvation? Which at the first, so this is the revelation that they've been privy to. That he's saying, because of this, you should be teachers. What have they received? At the first began to be spoken by the Lord. So the teachings of Christ. Now, they weren't eyewitnesses to Christ themselves. These Hebrew people probably hadn't ever seen Christ themselves, but they heard the teachings of Christ confirmed by the eyewitnesses. Does that make sense? They themselves, these Hebrew people, had heard the eyewitnesses firsthand say, this is what Jesus Christ taught, this is what he said, and we know this is true because we ourselves heard it. They had this kind of teaching. What a blessing, what a privileged position. But then there's more, verse 4. God also bearing them witness. So are you with me? These Hebrew people are hearing these eyewitness accounts of the teachings of Christ. And these eyewitness accounts are further confirmed by God himself. It says, God also bearing them witness. You knew that what these eyewitnesses were saying was true because God confirmed it. And how did God confirm it? With signs and wonders and with diverse miracles, all kinds of confirmations and even gifts of the Holy Ghost. God is saying the, the record of these eyewitnesses is valid. And I'm validating it by all of these indications, by signs, by wonders, by miracles, and by the Holy Spirit's gifts. This is how you know that their message is trustworthy. 
There was no reason for them to doubt what they had heard, what kind of revelation they had according to God's own will. And so now the author is saying, because you had all of this, you're without excuse. You yourself should be teaching. With this high amount of exposure to truth, with this amount of exposure to the gospel, with this amount of exposure to salvation, you should be teachers yourselves. But they're not. Instead of being able to teach themselves, they need to go back to the very beginning. They need to go back to the remedial class. You need to be taught the basics all over again. Why? And here's the key. What had happened? What had caused them when they heard this information and it was validated by God? What had happened then that causes this author to say, but instead of being a teacher, you need to go all the way back? What's their situation? They had heard the truth. They had to some level mentally assented to the truth. Yes, I confirm this as true. They had agreed with it. There's nothing to deny here. God confirmed it, so I agree with it. And they, by, by all understanding, even liked it. They weren't rejecting it. They said, this is true. I agree with it as true. I even like it. But what's the problem? They hadn't really made it their own. It's not enough just to say, yes, that sounds good. Yes, I like it. Information, education, affirmation. But for some, no salvation. And this is the warning here. They were on the very verge of salvation, but they'd never responded to it in personal faith and repentance. So is he speaking to all of the Hebrews? All of this audience? No. Well, then who? Well, those that have falsely professed the name of Christ and those who'd made no profession of Christ. You say, but they were so close though, right? If only everyone in the world had this response of saying, yes, I hear the word of truth and I agree with the word of truth and I like the word of truth. I mean, they're so close to being saved. Aren't they really on our side? Shouldn't we really be saving our arrows for the enemies? I mean, we shouldn't shoot our own. They're, they're really close to being Christians. They might even look like Christians. So why is he being so harsh? Isn't it good that all these things are true? Why this harsh rebuke? Doesn't it mean that they will be saved? I mean, if they're this close, doesn't this mean that they're probably just going to accept? Not necessarily. And that's the danger that this passage indicates for us. And this is why the author is pleading with them. This is why he's being so direct in his approach with them. They are in a very precarious position. Why? Because you cannot remain in this neutral state of indecision. A lot of times we can think that, right? Well, someone's just kind of on the fence, but it's okay because they, they haven't fully rejected it. So they're on this fence, so it's good, right? They could go either way. What he's saying is, as long as you're on this fence but not responding, that is a form of rejection. Every time that you're hearing this word of truth and not committing it, committing to it, that is a form of rejecting it. In this state, you are growing dull. He doesn't say in this state you're remaining neutral. There is no neutral position to the gospel. You either accept it or you reject it. And what he's saying is right now, because you're still resisting it, you're rejecting it. And what's the consequence of this kind of rejection? You're growing dull. You're growing hardened. In this state, you're becoming spiritually stupid. Because you haven't responded to this truth, you can't process any more truth. So until you deal with this heart need of salvation, you can't understand the deeper things of Christ that I want to explain to you. Do you see what he's saying? Look, I'm teaching you who Christ is, but I've got to stop right now. Because you can't process more information. You can't handle doctrine until you first get saved. Resisting the truth that you have prevents you from understanding more. Does that make sense? When you get this truth, but you say, but you know what? I don't want to make it mine. You can't move forward. You can't handle greater truths about Christ until you accept the truth that you've been given. This is a message for all of us. Sometimes we can feel like we're just spiritually getting more and more and more information, but that more and more and more information doesn't help us until we're obedient to it. And in fact, if we're not being obedient, we're blocking ourselves from receiving more truth. We can grow spiritually stagnant if we're not being obedient to every bit of God's word. And so he's pleading with them to go on 
to true salvation. He says, you need this. This is their situation. Until you deal with this heart need, you can't understand the deeper things of Christ that I want to explain to you. Resisting the truth that you have prevents you from understanding more. He's pleading with them, go on to true salvation. They don't need to learn more about Melchizedek. They need to personally accept Jesus Christ. So they need to go back to the basics. That's what he's saying. Back to the fundamentals. Back to square one about salvation. And that's what we see him saying in this verse. Verse 12. You ought to be teachers. But since you aren't, since you haven't responded to truth, you need that one teach you again. And what do they need to be taught again? Look what it says next. The first principles of the oracles of God. The first principles. What are these first principles? It's saying the fundamentals, the basics. If we're speaking of, of learning a language, he's saying, look, you need to go back to learning your ABCs. If you've ever tried to learn a language, that's where it starts, isn't it? When we took Greek, we started with a Greek alphabet. When I was learning Spanish, we started with a Spanish alphabet. And that's what he's saying. That's what this fundamentals mean. You need to go back to the most basic elements, but he's not saying the most basic elements of language, is he? No, he's saying you need to learn the ABCs again of the oracles of God. You say, well, what are these oracles of God? What are the ABCs here? It's really the Mosaic law. You say, how do I know? Oracles of God sounds confusing. How do I know that that's really referring to Mosaic law? Romans 3, 1 and 2. Paul writes, what advantage then does the Jew have? Does the Jew have any advantage over the Gentile? Does he have any privileged position any longer since salvation is offered to everyone? Is there any profit of circumcision? And look what he says, yes. Somehow the Jewish people still have a privileged position. And what is that? Chiefly because that unto them were committed what? The oracles of God. They were the first ones to receive this law of God. So they are in a privileged position as opposed to the Gentiles because they've had the word of God longer. You say, okay, but how do I really know that's Mosaic law? Acts 7, 35 to 38. This Moses whom they refused saying, who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same Moses did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Now note verse 38. This is he... Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai, what? And with him our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. This is very specific here, isn't it? The oracles that were given to Moses at Mount Sinai, what were these? Well, this is obviously the Mosaic law that God delivered to him there. That's what he's referring to, to the Hebrew people. It's the law. And that's what the author is saying here. Look, because you haven't yet responded to Christ in saving faith, what do you need? You need to go all the way back to the beginning. All the way back to the ABCs of the Mosaic law. Why? Because the Mosaic law would save them? No, because they missed the point of the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was never intended to be the way that someone would be saved. The Mosaic law just served to point people to the Savior. But he says, you've had it, but you've missed it. So what do we need to do? Let's go back to the basics again. Let's talk about the Mosaic law. What's he saying? You need to go back to the very beginning. You've been raised in this. Remember, he's speaking to Jewish people. You've grown up in this. This is all that you've known. This is more than just your religion. This is your identity as a people. This is your culture. But in spite of this, you've missed the whole point because all of it testifies of Christ. 
Again, we, all of Scripture is one redemptive story. And all of the Old Testament just points to Jesus Christ, the Redeemer. But he says, but you haven't accepted Christ. All the Old Testament points to him, but you've missed him. Because he came and you haven't responded in faith. You haven't accepted Christ in salvation. So we need to go all the way back to square one. Verse 12. And to become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, when we hear this analogy, what are we inclined to think? Just automatically, knee jerk reaction. Babies needing milk and mature needing strong meat. Our knee-jerk reaction is this is speaking of immature Christians and then mature Christians, right? That's our natural response because that's what we see in other places in Scripture. That's the analogy that's used. But here that's not the analogy. Just because he says baby, baby does not always refer to baby Christian. It can refer to someone who's just immature, someone who's unable to handle truth. And that's what he's saying here. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 5 is speaking of a baby Christian. Hebrews 5.12 is speaking of someone who's unsaved. So just because he uses a similar analogy, don't think he's speaking about the same condition, same situation. Does that make sense? So don't, let's not go down that path because it's a dangerous one. He's not saying you're a baby Christian. He's saying you're an infant. So you are incapable of understanding deep spiritual truths because you're a child. You're an infant. You're a baby. You still need the basics. So I can't move on. I can't teach you doctrine yet because you can't handle it because you're not saved. That's what he's saying here. Verse 13, and he goes on, and I think this is what explains that interpretation. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Everyone that's on a milk diet, only consuming milk, Every infant, here, every unsaved person is inexperienced in the word of righteousness. Unsaved people are ignorant of righteousness. Christians aren't ignorant of righteousness. The moment you're saved, you have the righteousness of Christ. So this, I believe, can't be speaking of believers Unskilled in righteousness can only apply to those who are unsaved. Unsaved people are ignorant of doctrine. They're ignorant of righteousness. They don't understand it. They don't possess it. They're ignorant of Christ, the source of righteousness. They're babies. That's what he's saying here. They can't process more because they don't understand Christ. They don't have discernment yet. Verse 14, but strong meat, this is doctrine, belongs to them who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Strong meat, or we could say doctrine, is for those who are saved. We don't give doctrine to unsaved people. Why? What's the first need that they have? Not more information. They need Christ. They need salvation. We don't indoctrinate the unsaved. Doctrine is for those who are spiritual adults, for those who are saved. Doctrine is for those who, through Christian experience, have learned to discern between good and evil. Unsaved people can't do that. So what's our summary? He's saying, I want to teach you all more about the doctrine of Christ through this illustration of Melchizedek. I want to teach you more about Christ's high priestly ministry. I want to teach you more about this through the illustration of Melchizedek, but there are those among you who can't receive it and won't be able to receive it until they are saved. Does that make sense? I think that's what's leading us to this warning passage. You say, but that sounds harsh, doesn't it? No, it's love. He doesn't want them to be lost. He wants them to understand truth. He wants them to understand doctrine. But first, they have to be saved. This is a stinging rebuke of those unsaved in his audience. He's pointed out their problem, their need of salvation. But he doesn't end there. He says, now that we've talked about the problem, let's talk about the solution. And what does he say next? Where does he go from here? This is chapter 6, verse 1. 
therefore. Because all of this is true, and you need to be saved first, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Does that scare you? He's just said, you need to be saved, so let's stop talking about Christ. It's not what this means. We'll work through this. Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. He's saying, so because this is true, because this is the situation that you are in, because you've heard these basic doctrines of Christ. You've heard all of this so much that you yourself should be teaching it, but are still unsaved. Let's stop discussing what you've already heard. I'm not just going to keep rehashing the things that you already know. Instead, I'm calling you to go on unto perfection. He's saying, let's stop talking about basic doctrine. And let's respond to it. He's not saying Christ and the doctrine of Christ is unimportant. He says, look, you already know it. What you need is not to be taught it again. What you need is to respond. What you need is to obey. You don't need more information. You need obedience. What you need is not to hear it all over again. What you need is to respond to it in salvation. And what exactly are these basic doctrines of Christ pressing for right now? That's, that's what he delineates here for us. There are six of them. There are six things that they already knew, but that they hadn't responded to yet. Number one, repentance from dead works. We could say literally, repenting from sin. Wouldn't you say that this is pretty important? Yes. In order to be saved, this must happen. They understood this doctrine. They understood the need to turn from the works that lead to death, as Romans 6.21 says. They knew that they needed to repent from sin. And he says, right now we're not going to talk anymore about repentance. You know that you need to turn from your sin. You know it so well that you should be teaching it, but you haven't done it. You know about turning from sin, but you haven't turned from sin. Next doctrine, faith towards God. We could say literally faith in God. Again, wouldn't you say this is fundamental to salvation? Yes, you've got to turn from sin and turn in faith to God. And he says, we're not going to talk anymore about that either. You know that you need to have faith in God. You already know that faith in God is essential. You know that the righteous must live by his faith. That's Old Testament. Habakkuk 2.4, they knew that. This is not a new concept for them. He says, you've heard this over and over, but you're not possessing it. You're not demonstrating it. What other doctrines do they know but aren't living? The doctrine of baptisms. Now, this is an unfortunate translation in our English Bibles. Because this is literally saying washings. It's translated this way elsewhere. You know the doctrine of washings. What is this? Well, ceremonial cleansing. Again, remember, they knew the sacrificial system. They knew that they needed to be cleansed. He says, you know all about this need for ritual cleansing. And you know that it really points to your spiritual need of spiritual cleansing. You know all of this. But you haven't done this either. What's next? The laying on of hands. When we hear this, we think of what? Ordination, right? Sending someone out. That's not what he's saying. I think here he's saying sacrificial ritual. Remember when an animal would be sacrificed? How did they identify with that substitutionary sacrifice? Do you remember what they had to do? They would place their hand on the head of that animal. That was their sacrifice for sin. And he says, look, you know all about that laying on of hands. You know that you need a sacrifice to take away your sins. You know that because the Old Testament pointed to that. Not only that you needed cleansing, but that you needed a substitutionary sacrifice. You know that, but you haven't responded to Christ to be yours. You haven't asked him to be your sacrifice for sin. You haven't responded to him in salvation. What's next? This doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Boy, it sounds like they had a pretty sound theology, doesn't it? I mean, they're covering all the information. The resurrection. 
This is not a uniquely new doctrine either. The doctrine of the resurrection was taught throughout the Old Testament. Remember what Job said. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and will stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body will be eaten and destroyed, yet in my flesh will I see God. Now that sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? This flesh is going to be gone. But in this flesh I'll see God. How could he say that? Because he knew the reality of the resurrection. This has been taught from the earliest in the Old Testament. And he says, you know that there's going to be a resurrection. You know this but you're not living in light of it. So we're not going to keep discussing it. It's not what you need here. You already know about this. And finally, eternal judgment. Eternal judgment. You already know that there is a coming judgment. You know that God, the judge of all the earth, will do right, will one day execute righteousness, that there will be eternal consequence for sin. You know this too. And he says, we're not going to keep talking about this. Why? Because they haven't responded to this either. This is why this harsh warning. You see what he's saying here? It's possible to believe in all of these things and still not be saved. If you were witnessing to someone that agreed with you on every single one of these points, wouldn't your reaction be, well, I guess you're saved right? You know the need for repentance. You know the need for faith. You know the need for cleansing. You know the need for sacrifice. You know the coming judgment. You know everything. What else is there? It's not enough to know. Information is not enough. You can believe in all of these things and still not be saved. You can believe in each of these key points of doctrine. Right doctrine doesn't necessarily mean conversion. This sounds shocking, but this is true. You can have all of the right information. You can believe about all the right things. Sound theology doesn't always mean saving faith. What he's saying is information alone is not enough. There must be a right heart response to truth. Remember, we talked about this when we talked about the gospel, how we define the gospel. God, man, Christ. And what's that fourth key element? response. Actually making it yours. There must be a right heart response to truth. And there were some in this Hebrew congregation that had all the information, but weren't truly saved. There might be some here this morning that this is true of as well. Not rejecting things. Not saying, no, I don't believe that Jesus is real and I don't believe that sin is a problem. Not, not outwardly objecting to it. But you can have all the information but not have really made it yours. And sometimes we can pride ourselves in our Bible knowledge, can't we? Oh, look at my doctrine. Look at my theology. It's sound. It's orthodox. I've been raised in church. And I think these are the very ones that Christ will someday utter those words to, those horrible words of, Depart from me, I never knew you. Because again, it's not just about having information, and it's not just about doing the right things. It's about responding to Christ in true saving faith. If you aren't truly saved, God's not impressed with Bible knowledge. If you're not truly saved, God's not impressed with just works. He wants faith. He wants a right heart response. And God, through this text, is pleading with all of us today to be saved. If you haven't placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone to save you, what he's saying is you don't need more information. You need to act on the information that you have. You need salvation. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying to these people. And I already know we're already out of time. This is where I thought we might get. In my notes, I made a note 6-3 because I always preach through these to see how long they take. And I knew I'd get carried away. He said, what's the application here then? Shame on some of those Hebrews that should have known better. Sometimes that's our tendency, right? Or to think of other people. Oh, I know of people that this is true of. I know of people that have lots of right answers, but I don't think are really saved. Friends, that's not the point of this passage. God didn't give us this passage to look at other people. God gave us this passage to search our own heart. Because the real danger is that we are capable of self-deception. 
We ourselves are capable of saying, you know what, I have all of this, and so me and God, we're good. And I'm not trying to get you who are truly saved to question your salvation, but I'm saying in 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 an assembly this size, there very well could be some that are operating under the false notion that they're saved when they're truly not. And this exhortation is for every single one of us to search our own hearts and say, God, am I really following you in right heart relationship, or is it just head knowledge? Am I just going through the motions? Or is Jesus Christ really the Lord of my life? Is he really my Savior? Am I truly saved? Or am I self-deceived? And so that's the question for us this morning, is just to do business with God. God, are you speaking to me? Are there things in my life that indicate that I'm not truly saved, that I might have lots of information, that I might even like truth? That's not the question. God, have I responded in obedience? God, when you speak to things in my life that are not right with you, do I respond in obedience? And if not, why not? What's keeping me from a right relationship with you? Maybe it's because I'm not saved. Or maybe I'm saved, but I just don't have a right relationship. Get right with God. What God wants from each one of us is just a heart that responds to him in instant obedience. God, you can put your finger on anything in my life, and God, it's yours. I'm yours. Everything I have is yours. That's the heart of the saved. God, I belong to you. You're in charge. That's what Lord means. And a lot of people want a savior. But not everyone wants a Lord. Not every single person wants to submit to God's rightful authority. And friends, if we're not, there's serious cause for concern. So that's my challenge for each one of us, is that we would use this passage as a mirror for God to evaluate us, for us to honestly look in God's perfect law of liberty and say, God, is there something in my life that's not right with you? And if not, why not? If I'm not saved, I need you to be saved. And if I am saved, I want to be right with you. May God do that work in our hearts this morning. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love us and that you love us too much to leave us in our sin, that you love us enough to warn us, to confront us where there are areas that we're not responding to you in obedience. And Lord, I pray that if there would be one here this morning that isn't truly saved, that hasn't truly accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that you would do this convicting work in their hearts to draw them to true saving faith. For those of us that are saved, if there are those of us that are not living according to truth, that are not obedient in our Christian walk, that you would convict us of this, where your desire for us is obedience to your word. And I pray that we would respond that way this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.